Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Edwin Ted Sulker. <laughs> Ted Sulker is what he goes by. Um, he's here from CMU's Silicon Valley um, Labs, where he works most of his time, and the rest of his time he's spending freelancing and doing really cool projects, um, always innovating, always doing interesting stuff. Um, Ted is very well known for his adaptive user interface work. He was probably one of the first to start with adaptive help systems for users back in the 80s. Um, spent many years at IBM Research, about 14 years there, um, very well known for his work in IBM. And then went to the MIT Media Lab where he did really interesting projects like in-car navigation systems and context-aware systems. Uh, and I'm sure he'll tell you more about the work he's been up to more recently. But right now, Ted, why don't you take it away? Okay, thanks. Thank, thank you, Mary. I've <clears throat> uh, known about this lab more than I've uh, ever been here. I, I may have been here once um, when, when uh, you guys were a sponsor of the Media Lab. Um, and I sent Andrea Lockhart, my, one of my best students, here one summer to, uh, to do some work. Now she's a Georgia Tech professor. Um, so uh, I have been thinking about the intersection between uh, AI and user interface for all my career. And um, uh, these days I've kind of, you know, it, what I realized uh, at some point is that a lot of <clears throat> what um, mattered uh, in, in my successes was this uh, uh, impedance match that you try to create between people's expectations and, and the person. And most recently, I've kind of taken what I used to be calling context-aware computing and, and thinking about what the layer on top of that is. It's uh, a grant proposal that I'm, that I'm waiting on from NSF. And so what, what does it mean to be a considerate system? Um, is what we'll talk about today. Here's a picture of a, uh, a cigarette that I made when I was kind of taunting Philip Morris about the fact that uh, maybe they had something to offer besides the drug delivery uh, in the bar when the bars would stop, um, stop letting them have cigarettes. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about what, that, what that's about, um, why, why that's interesting. Um, and, uh, and yet the whole idea of social connection uh, probably is, is, is essential to every use of everything we, we have. It's, it's kind of what we live for is, is social connection. I um, used to run a, oh darn it. Uh, how, see, things, things can be very sure that they're important. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's not always, you know, you know, maybe it isn't up to them it, that, that, they're, that they're so important. Maybe it's up to me. So anyway, um, I, I, I ran a group. I built uh, the user uh, group, User System Ergonomics Research is what I called it, at IBM uh, back uh, uh, the early 90s. And we had physical, graphical, and cognitive interface groups. Um, this here, I will just take a moment to talk about just because this um, it w actually went to product. Uh, and it, it, was a, um, it used all sorts of techniques that are quite different from, from what Bob, Bob and, 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 um, and, and the other ways that you try to simplify things that Microsoft do. So the idea was to give people access to the full uh, fancy interface. If you saw it for printer install, it would look like printer install with this strange overlay. And I did a bunch of visual work to um, uh, understand that people could find things if there was, if there was an overlay like this as fast as though it was the only thing on the, on the screen, that they could find all of these other things as fast as if there was nothing on. So it's kind of a neat thing where this see-through scrim allowed the, uh, the adaptive agent to be deciding how to present um, uh, um, help at the novice, intermediate, professional, or expert level based on its experience expertise that it, it had seen you demonstrate uh, to help you through these yucky things like printer install and all those things. OS2 uh, doesn't exist anymore. That went away. But anyway, that was just, uh, uh, I, I bring that up just because, you know, you guys did so much interesting work in that area. And I don't know, I'd be interested in following it. Um, so did all this stuff there. Then I went off to MIT Media Lab because 
Well, my dad always wanted to be a professor, and they'd asked me three times. Um, I, you know, actually uh, don't like Boston so much. Wanted my kids to come from Palo Alto, and came home after ten years. Um, and uh, so I'm teaching at CMU Silicon Valley. Um, and for example, right now I'm teaching a. Oh my God, it's so exciting! I'm teaching an Android uh, product development class. We are four and a half weeks in, and I have out of 22 students, I have like 14 apps that are demonstrable, and they use everything from the GPS to 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 maps to to accelerometers. I mean, it's just amazing how the program development tools of today bring in all of those fancy window debuggers and everything we loved back in the list machine days that I lived in uh, and, and, and allow people to have a sensor and effector data you know, uh, platform that any roboticist you know, would go crazy to have. But that's that. So that's just the intro about me. So at the, my group at, um, at MIT, I made lots of stuff. And uh, we'll talk about some of it in terms of what it uh, means for making a considerate world um, as we go through. But the, the idea, you know, is that using virtual sensors, virtual sensors are a model of task, user, and system that allows a sensor to, you know, have a consider phase instead of just a calibration phase. Um, and, you know, the goal is to respect human intention. Um, so here's, here's a bunch of the stuff I made at the Media Lab. Um, but uh, probably the power bra isn't so relevant to today's uh, talk. Um, but I, you know, these are typically uh, made as, as, um, as platforms to, 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 do, to allow research to happen. For example, this, this floor here is being used in an art ex uh, exhibit in New York. This floor was made for commenting on social interactions between people. I, I made this cute one transistor per square foot approach that we ran our lab on. Um, and um, and, uh, um, and and with the idea that you know maximum implicit communication, like you walking around, is going to reduce how much interaction you're having with systems because actually it's the people and your tasks that we care about, um, and uh, and we want to uh, take the tool out of the task, as uh, as Heidegger would say. So so the idea in that in that with that floor, uh, well, is. Uh, is shown with these little little guys uh, making social commentary about if, if there's some people standing next to each other, it'll kind of make little butterflies. And if there's a bunch of people standing in one place and one over there, it'll paint a podium on the floor underneath them and shine a light on their face so that they can give their talk. And uh, if no one's in the room with you, it'll take you through my lab, all these demos that were all over the place, and, and present them to you. And if other people are in the room with you, it kind of gets a little more demure because it's really annoying to have computers talk to you when you're trying to talk to other people. Um, and so there's the sensor, right? Um, and these are some of the things it, it did. So in terms of trying to understand what, what would be uh, <clears throat> uh, um, considerate, one of my most interesting projects was uh, something with um, uh, public television. And what we built was, what, what, I, what I built was uh, a website to go along with the forgetting. The forgetting is a one-hour uh, 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 special about Alzheimer's. And my first idea about to making this we website when I was helping them develop that, that public um, television uh, program was that I would, you know, help people connect with each other and we'd get lots of photographs on, their webs on the website of their life and we'd get them email so they could keep, keep in contact with people. And, you know, working with experts, I found out that was the opposite of what you want. Um, what you want is to make their life work and make them calm. And so when the, the typical scenario is when people come to visit an Alzheimer's uh, patient, uh, both of them end up stressed and uh, with elevated meds for a few days, uh, if not uh, therapy. So making kind of eight uh, different interactive scenarios for them uh, where they could interact as much as they c were able to uh, was, was really what we ended up with, and it worked great. So this is a puzzle, um, and this puzzle, you know, you can pick whatever photograph. It's got a dog and a cat playing with each other. And it's putting itself together, right? This piece is about to fall down there. And when this whole thing's full, it's going to make a nice bezel across around here, and it's going to go, ta-da! It's going to be very proud of me having, you know, puzzle, 
put the puzzle together. But if you start fiddling with these, with the, with the cursor keys, with the, with the, with the mouse, anything, um, it will let you place them so you can go faster. Now, if you do that and show that you're succeeding, it will make it harder. So when their 11-year-old kid is, is over there playing with this puzzle, it gets really hard. They're flipping upside down. They're going in the wrong place, and he's having to fight this thing, right? And in that way, everyone gets to have the fun of watching this, you know, totally competent kid do this puzzle. And if, and if, and if, uh, and it, but, or you can just sit here and watch it do it. And so, so it's kind of adjusting. It's adaptive. And it's, in other words, um, making, making adjustments to, to you. So uh, just as uh, another example of, of having that, that thing where you take the fact that uh, an Alzheimer's uh, person is, uh, you know, critically sophisticated. They'll, they'll tell you if something's, you know, uh, somebody's instrument's off key by, you know, a little smidgen. I, I, I tr trust you, I've, I've been there. Um, they are productively challenged. They can't even make a sentence, usually. Uh, so so this, this kaleidoscope is another example where um, it's making these pictures and they're all kind of self-similar until you hit the keyboard. And then it takes that as criticism and changes somewhat. And then it kind of trying to build a hypothesis of what it is about these patterns that you like. And so you'll find these people feeling and actually being uh, somewhat creative when in fact it's kind of taking the art historian feedback and making an art historian be an artist, which is something I've, I've talked about and, and been building this stupid kaleidoscope for, I don't know, since 79 actually. But I finally found a place for it. <laughs> And people like to play with it. There's a bunch of other things they like. People like packing with Alzheimer's, and and I, I found myself giving them flowers to pack because packing suitcases makes them think they might have to move or something's going to change big in their life. Uh, you know, it's much much more androgynous to have them putting tools around outside in a in a in a um, in a yard than having them you know play with tools in the basement, which is dark. They can't stand dark or or uh, or or kitchen uh, things, which is not androgynous. Anyway, people would ki skip lunch to play with this thing. You guys can go online and play it. Uh, it's still there. Um, so, Arrange you know. another time. Would it tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. work for you? So this is uh, an early uh, project I did uh, when I first got to the Media Lab. You see that floor again. Um, and uh, it was an IUI paper. Um, so uh, basically, just you know, the thresholds kind of an important social demarcation. Are you in? Or are you out? Are you allowed to be part of this conversation or not? So we just said, you know, what can we do about that? And and when I'm in my office alone, I don't have something on my schedule. And Win Burleson, now a professor in Arizona uh, State, um, knocks on the door. It, it pops something up on my screen. And I say, let him in. He lets in. If there's somebody in the room, it says, do you want to disturb Ted to him when he knocks on the door? And if, I, uh, um, and if he says yes, then it will try to ask me again. If I say, eh, it will put up a calendar. The calendar, is, of course, has a model of the organization, too. So it gives him when I speak with students as opposed to when my wife comes, and it shows all of my schedule. Um, and so, uh, you know, when Nicholas Negroponte comes, just come on in. doesn't even ask me, right? You know, he built the damn building. Uh, so, so very simple little expert system kind of blah blah rule system approach, but what's neat about it is that it, it, it kind of codifies, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of the things that we really mm, uh, succeed uh, at at using to 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 demarc that that very important social uh, moment. Um, this dog, he's gonna bark. <laughs> Amazing. So that's Diane Sawyer kind of uh, playing with me and my dog. Uh, <laughs> my dog. Uh, has an infrared uh, sensor on top of it, and this is IR. IR uh, is uh, it's about identity. I I uh, exist. Uh, it also uses infrared, and the circuit board has an I with an eyebrow and an R in the back. But in any case, the point is it has one photodiode looking at your eye, and with that one photodiode, it can distinguish blinking nervously, staring intently gazing around without much, you know, not much direction, closing your eyes, winking, uh, eyes closed. So that was kind of my goal, was to say you could see all of these social remarks with a $1 microchip pick, and um, even with bright lights on it works, it seems. That's why I have that 
MIT cap on, by the way. <clears throat> um, but you stare at this dog and he starts barking. You stare at a person at a party and they, get your, they, they, they will get your business card. You stare at a demo, it will play. We had two videos set up and even with that one photodiode um, and, and our IR beacon, we could tell which one you were interested in and then change the video on the other one. Saab used it to, to see about, uh, to, to notice um, uh, in cockpits how people were were uh, focusing on their on their tasks, uh, so I was kind of happy about that. Um, um, and here I am again on another version of uh, Good Morning America, actually in bed uh, on Broadway. It was a very scary thing <laughs> um, um, because uh, they got 100,000 watts of light, and I was using structured light this time, something called Blue Eyes. I don't know if you guys anybody's ever seen that eye track. It's a structured eye tracking system that I built when I was at a um, in my group at um, Myron Flicker actually ran that project at, at, uh, at IBM. But anyway, the whole point is that, you know, maybe what we do that is staring at things isn't as important. I mean, where we're staring might not be as important as how we are being affectively. And what's nice about this bed is I could just lay anybody in this bed in my lab and it, <laughs> longest running demo at Media Lab probably. I mean, you'd sit that, you'd lay anybody down in this bed and the nice thing is it held their had stable, right? Nice thing for eye tracking. And then if they, you know, woke up, the alarm turns off. And if they stare at their email, it pops up on this thing. And if they blink nervously, it, it might go away. And if they look at the TV, it turns on. And if they blink nervously, it'll change the station. And, and so just, just using this, you know, little teeny language of things that we are already thinking we do, right? Which we already, you know, it's very easy to teach people the gestures they know. And I think a lot of user interface uh, experience problems happen when we impose languages that are foreign as opposed to ones that already can be, uh, you know, augmenting what a person already believes kind of these things are kind of for. Um, and that's what the, the ceiling looked like. It's those hills and there's books and emails scattered around on the hills there. You know, kind of. um, now, this all started when some, we, we got the according to them. Scientists are even using cameras to track your eyes. The cursor moves to what you're looking at, and the computer puts that information on the screen. That's a younger Ted, sorry. But uh, uh, that was an ABC News segment about this, about this thing called um, in, uh, Souter. And uh, Paul Maglio and I uh, did this. Um, and what it was is when we got Blue Eyes working originally, I said, look, people can't stand being told to look at something. In fact, if they look at things very long, it's kind of uncomfortable. You know, and all these eye tracking systems that think you're going to stare at something and then, and then that, you know, select it and move it over there, ignore the point that our, our, our eyes are actually a guard dog, mostly, right? They're mostly just saying, hey, there's no tigers coming right now. And anything you look at, you know, you can close your eyes and see it for another second anyway. So what we did is we put this thing down at the, you know, it was back uh, when people were starting to put banners across things. And, and we had it streaming stuff that was kind of, we had this little, you know, little bit of heuristic that would choose, you know, help things from the command you were typing in your, in your uh, command editor um, in C++ or some news. And if something attracted your attention, we could tell the difference between staring for a third of a second and, and just reading the headline. And what's neat about a third of a second is that the fastest I've ever seen anybody do pointing with any of the devices I've designed or any of the other people's is, is, a, is 0.9 seconds. So what that means is that we can make, let people make selections and pop up the article about fuel, uh, robot seeks work as fuel tank inspector um, faster than you can make the selection with direct manipulation. So, sorry, Ben. Ben Schneiderman always says that direct manipulation always wins. Um, and there's a whole lot of stuff about eye tracking that, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, back in the 60s already, there was these, well, it's not that long ago, uh, there was this guy that, you know, coming home to dinner is a, is a uh, famous painting, and he said, he asked these people these various uh, questions. And what's neat is he could kind of reliably get completely different eye tracking patterns depending on what, what he asked of, of them. And so that's kind of exciting to realize that you can tell what people are thinking pretty reliably, even if you can't get people to point at a, t uh, at a word and have them select it um, with eye tracking. And so uh, I had a master's student, um, uh, Mike Lee, 
uh, make this system that might, I guess it doesn't have a video running, um, where, uh, there it is, um, um, where basically as you I moved your eyes around, it grouped all of the uh, MIT Media Lab sponsors. So you could tell that, you know, if a person was interested in Intel and, and HP and, and, you know, and my, you know, Microchip and Philips at the same time, it kind of grouped their, those sponsors together just by watching your eyes. There's blue eyes. So, so. And that was uh, pretty successful. But the most successful thing about that project was that if you t watched the eye tracking uh, uh, vector of where a person was looking, you could actually get a better, much more accurate, I mean, I, I think it was five times more accurate uh, um, idea of where the, where the cursor was by watching I mean, where the person was looking by watching the, 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 eye, the ballistic motion over and then back. And so you see where these two vectors meet, and that's where the, that's, that, that vertex is, is much more precise than if you have the guy just stand there and stare at the, at, at, at the pace on this, and there, you, know, you watch the tremor and the, all the other awful things that the eye tries to do to keep from being stationary. And so that was probably, I think, one. But, but you know, we tried lots of other... Um, uh, you know, modalities too for, for seeing if we could watch people's intention. And, and Andrea Lockhart, uh, now a roboticist, uh, um, did this great piece of work with Florian Mueller, who's now in um, Australia. And, and uh, what we did is we just took the microphone from a camcorder and we took uh, and, and, and pointed at the person. We also, you know, put one of these galvanic Skinner uh, detectors on, on, the, on the wristband of the, of the camcorder, right? And, and I, I, I have an attitude about this. Uh, oh, look, here's like this. Thing I can point with. Um, and, and this is the galvanic skin response. Uh, as we know, it's an incredibly noisy channel. And you know, who knows if what happened here. Maybe there was a bad electrical connection. Maybe the sun went away. I don't know. But if we looked at what our support vector machine had done uh, with the training data, we find that we can very reliably find these three points where Andrea was reacting to the stuff she was videotaping. So this is an hour in, in, in Harvard Square, and at one point she was watching some people play drums uh, at the entrance to the red line, which everyone likes to watch, and she was enjoying that and giggled a little bit. And another time somebody was taking a video of her, taking a picture of them, you know. And then a third time there was actually something probably legitimate that she was videoing. But anyway, the point is that this kind of gives us uh, the data that we need for automatic editing, or at least annotations. Uh, metadata uh, using the sensors that already exist. I think it's just amazing how for a long time we've said, oh, we need more sensors, more sensors. You know, it wasn't we needed more sensors. Yeah, we need more sensors. This is great. I mean, the Motorola, do you know the Motorola phone that's coming out just added to its, 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 sensor, uh, its sensor suite, which included a, an accelerometer, a compass, and GPS, a, um, uh, a gyroscope? I mean, Tell me, it'd be, it'd, it'd be lovely if they told us why before they did it. I mean, the, the great news is now there's this huge marketplace and people are thinking about what to do with these sensors. But for, anyway, we'll keep on that. The point is that there's been good sensors and lots of things that we could use as scenario designers and, and get some somewhere with. Now, um, this one uh, is, is uh, really one of my favorites. Uh, Andrea's um, master's thesis um, uh, was an email system that she actually came up here and tried to g encourage you guys to think about uh, with the summer of her. Uh, and that, what, what's, what happened is we took a, um, an email system and we made what I call the ransom note uh, interface on, on top of it. And uh, this ransom note interface, you know, put these weird bars and changed the, the fonts and put colors on it, you know, pretty ugly. Doesn't take any more real estate per, per message. But what we found is comparing um, this to a normal uh, email system, taking the same amount of real estate per, per message, um, we got some differences. And uh, what, this, what, what these colorations are is um, you'd, you'd imagine that, um, that uh, red might be uh, um, uh, scary. Actually, it means that uh, it's uh, something of big importance. So we maybe got the valence of, the, of, the, of our ransom note wrong even. I mean, maybe you'd think green would be good and red would be bad, but no, we were too stupid for that. All we did is we looked at uh, a bunch of training data. We'd thrown a bunch of parties, and if people would send email, social email, as part of getting to know the new people, they get to go to the next party. So we wanted to get social, not, not business emails. And uh, we, again, you know, a little bit of machine learning, and said, gosh, these ones are urgent, these guys are people you like, these are people you want to ignore, 
and gave some visual indication of that. Okay, so um, when we asked, used that same training data to look at this email, the bad news is that 60 to 75 percent coverage. It was terrible, right? Barely, you know, barely reason, I mean, you know, if you only can tell within 65, you know, 75 percent that something's true, is that useful? Well, it turns out it was. A uh, significant uh, difference between people having the uh, annotated uh, emails about what was important and what was urgent um, compared to the other one. Not in how many emails they read, but in which ones they responded to. Um, and so we were very proud of that. Uh, very, very exciting thought that even noisy, noisy uh, machine learning data uh, can, can, can improve people's uh, performance. And not only that, but in my experience with almost all the experiments I've done, uh, when you have uh, an improvement in, in, in um, performance, you have an improvement in perception. And if you don't, then you have to run other experiments. And so I, I, I was really excited about this, still am, uh, and, and believe that <laughs> maybe we can make a better interface to show off that stuff. But I think um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's also exciting to me that, that something other than quarantining emails into folders might be possibly useful, right? Uh, because those quarantining into folders that we've done for 40 years actually is really annoying. Uh, Who put the call out on the messages? It was like an automated way? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So is our, is our, you know, is our, it was following our, our, uh, our, our, our um, we, had, we had like, you know, six, six different uh, attributes uh, based on training data from these emails that we'd gotten from a bunch of people just interacting. And uh, so, yeah, so I think that there's a lot that can be done in improving communication. I think that uh, this uh, um, affective uh, response of the system, uh, when it's not meant to just do things for you but uh, annotate them, is something that I've been pushing for for all my whole career. I say that there's two kinds of agents. There's um, assistive agents and advisory agents. Advisory agents teach you to, teach you to fish. Assistive agents give you a fish. And the idea of, of uh, there's a lot of other reasons that I'm kind of trying to promote about uh, why advisory agents are good. If they're wrong, you can laugh at them as opposed to be, in, uh, be destroyed by them. Um, here's another uh, communications example. This was Best Paper Award at IUI by Hugo Liu. I don't know if any of you know of him, but he's a really amazing star. Unfortunately, he is trying to make companies rather than be uh, <laughs> academic. But if you ever have a chance, work with him. Um, and, and we had... Uh, this common sense knowledge base, open, uh, has, does anybody know about open mind? Uh, you guys know about open mind? So anyway, you've got a million utterances people have made. And there's a lot of problems with open mind in my view. But one thing that's really got to be true is, you know, if we look through it and see what kind of things people say with the word anger or fear or surprise or happiness in it, that, that, that it gives a lot of different alternatives for those. And so what we did is we used that to color a response about, uh, about, about the email that I was sending. So, you know, it says, um, I haven't talked to you for a while. Then it, 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 when you do that, I'm not going to run the video, but it, it, you're kind of, it's kind of sad. And I was wondering how you've been, kind of expectant. And then I, I had a pretty crazy weekend, you know, and that becomes the surprise. I went skydiving last Saturday outside New York, and skydiving is. And so what's interesting is that we used to have just text up here, you know, surprise, Fear. And no one responded. No one noticed it. And as soon as we put these, you know, you know shabbily drawn, sorry, uh, you know, fa face, face images up there for, the, you know, the four uh, um, different um, uh, emotions, huge impact. You just, you just change what you're typing. I mean, does it surprise you that when you're flaming away, if there was somebody reacting to you, you might think about it and reflect and improve your email? Oh, well, no one does that. Um, so uh, the question of how you respond uh, to, to things socially was kind of a, uh, a fun, when I got my hands on uh, Chrysler uh, and us built this concept car together, and when I got my hands on it, the first thing I did was start looking at all these, you know, we had 209 sensor systems in there, and I just threw them all away, and I put, I just, all I looked at was, was on what's called the CAN2 interface bus, and, and uh, so, you know, braking, steering, gas, speed, turning radius, and actually what's in the cup holder because we had all these sensors around. And I just had these two knobs. This one's called affirmation and this one's called criticism. And that was my goal, is to, is to move those up and down. Well, 
in the end, we, we did all sorts of experiments instead of having people actually move them. We moved them for them. And we found out various things. I think this is the only slide on this, so I'll just tell you the story. The story is that if you wait a quarter of a second to two seconds, if nothing else is happening, people listen much better. Not what I was expecting. I was expecting immediate feedback's important, right? Second thing that we, that we learned uh, that was, that, that was um, Tally Sharon's thesis. Uh, second thing that we learned that was even more exciting and something that I kind of believed in beforehand and um, is I believe maybe a variable schedule of reinforcement would be better than a, than a predictable one. And we learned even more. We learned that if you say very many things that are negative, you are completely going to make people make more errors in their driving. That's the most important result. Uh, if you make positive ones, rarely it'll help. So rarely positive, very, very infrequently negative. Um, don't respond every time they do something. And it's the funniest that the, one of the worst things about being a, a user interface person that believes in ethnography is that we go out and we built this thing and we take people in it and we watch how they feel. Well, guess what? The, the, everybody that gets in it, when they pull away from the curb, they say, ah, that's so cool. Well, I'm sitting there, I built it, it's a beautiful car, blah, blah, blah. It turns out, if it, if, if it says, blinkers please, when you move away from the curb, that's an immediate negative, right? And in fact, you're, you're, although you might say, <laughs> that's cool, which is what the press said and everybody else said, in fact, that's not going to be a productive relationship. And I think that's what's really missing in a lot of uh, human factors experiments, is that we take too much, we take too, you know, <laughs> guess what? We pay attention to each other. And I think uh, a lot of our, our, our work can, can, can be a little too uh, uh, focused on. Yes, please. So is this what has informed your uh, perspective of assistant versus advisory? Uh, always. I mean, I'm always testing those things. And, you know, uh, it all starts with, um, a as you start building anything that's an adaptive interface, people immediately freak out. And, you know, they freak out from the, the beginning of the 80s talking about, my gosh, you know, my dot .chrc is not what I thought it was, right? I mean, you know, and, and, and so many bad, ex bad experiences with brittle systems that don't, that change underneath us, right? And so what I've done is dozens of experiments showing ways of making uh, systems that have, that, that modify themselves in ways that don't disrupt and, and destroy your productivity. Right, and that's, that's an exci exciting news, is that I've, you know, what I set out to do at MIT, and I feel like I achieved with those 50 different examples, was show that across, you know, domains, you know, in natural and even in dangerous settings like kitchens and cars, you can make productive improvement to people's performance using AI systems that actually modify their, their, their treatment of you, and 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 uh, and 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 and, uh, and do it in a way that doesn't that doesn't disrupt and dis, d, d, you know and, and and distract you and so that's kind of that's kind of the bottom line is and and yeah there's probably some advice you know there's a system of things you can do but it's so much uh, lower hanging fruit to do things that are advisory and then, you know also I mean there's lots of assistive things that works right ABS brakes work. Well, maybe using a, not, a car without ABS brakes after you've used one with ABS isn't so good anymore, right? It turns out, right? But it is, you know, lot, the direction that the automotive industry has gone is very assisted, right? You know, it's going to park for you. It's going to find the car in front of you. It's going to, you know, and, and yet I, I kind of tend to, to say, yeah, but there's other things you can do. They're cheaper, they're simpler, and they're better for, for, for learning in some cases. I'm not going to. If I make blanket statements, people will find counterexamples. But, but I think the most important thing is, is to, to, you know, what we're looking for is things that don't, don't uh, make people dis feel disrupted. And, yeah? So, so to follow that up, if, if Oh, no, oh, sorry. sorry. Let me stop that. Yes. So, so if in, in the example of the, of the turn signal, mm. when you see someone if the system knows that you don't normally turn the blinker on when you turn left, rather than saying you didn't turn your blinker on, are you saying that it would turn the blinker on for you? Oh, no, that would be an assistive one. What I want to do is I want to wait till you use the blinker and say, thank you for blinking. Okay. That's what I want to do. Right. I mean, if I have to, I'll tell you, you know, blinker, please, you know. But I'll do it 
in a situation where you're, it's not like in a four-lane road where you're turning left from the right-hand lane and the, and the, the, the light's orange, right? That's not what I'm going to tell you about your blinker. Right? I don't want to do more to, uh, to, to, to load up your cognitive problems. Right? You're, already, you're already in a dangerous situation. Don't make it worse. What would be the problem? What would be wrong with doing it for you? So you, you so noticing that you've made these particular motions to turn? Just so you do it right every single time and the person doesn't ever need to know about blinkers, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, and and in terms of low, you know, in terms of making robust systems is the question, right? These are collaborations. Everything we do with computers is a collaboration. It's a mixed initiative event. No matter what it is, no matter what you think it is, it's mixed initiative, right? People will do. You know, I don't know if you anybody's old enough to remember when they started putting the the the, the things. The door is open. The door is open in cars. You remember those things? And no, no, oh, sorry, I don't. Yeah, see, okay, he I, I actually, yeah, I actually didn't ever. I wasn't there, but uh, no, but, you know, and and it's amazing how awful it is, regardless of what the you know those policymakers believe they were doing to, to to help us. Right. So. Okay. Um, this is. Okay. This was a lot of work. This is 14 displays on a, on a Pepsi machine, all coordinated with Max S XMP running. Oh, it's a mess. Anyway, but, but the deal is um, this was motivated by, uh, um, well, Pepsi was a sponsor. <laughs> but one of my uh, students went to a mall, and there was a map on the front of a Pepsi machine. Maybe it wasn't a Pepsi machine. Oh, please. Stop. Uh, um, and there was a bunch of people standing around looking at this map. And uh, so my you know, MIT kid has a lot of self-importance. And he walks up and buys a soda. And all of a sudden, everyone starts buying a soda. Now, what, were they buying sodas because he'd showed them how? Were they buying sodas because he'd, he'd encouraged them to? Or were they all wanting to buy the soda, but they didn't want to disrupt this everybody looking at the map thing? Or, you know, or what? We don't know. But anyway, my goal was to get all of that gigantic labeling off the sides of these soda machines and make them into a Starbucks. And so as you walk up to this, there's an eye tracker, face interface, this guy's thesis, um, that's staring at you. And if there's one person that puts up a game for one and she introduces you, um, and uh, um, to, 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 you can play games. And it isn't, you don't actually have to tell people they can buy soda, but we tell them they can buy soda. Because People come up to these, this machine, even when it was like not even plugged in, and they'd put money into it. It's amazing. People are very much trained to put money into slots. I don't understand it. But in any case, it did all sorts of things. Like it had news on, on, on when, you weren't, when you were walking by as an attractor, and it, and it, uh, it made you play these puzzles that were collaborative when there were two people in front of it, uh, as opposed to so it put up two people games when there were two. A lot, lot of fun. Um, and, and why did I say Starbucks? I believe that you know there's a lot of reasons people put the soda machine next to the next to the uh, um, the bathroom in the back of the you know stairwell you know I mean it's it's kind of you know they're so garish now this is not any less garish but at least it would maybe attract people to hang around and there's a lot of things you could do like maybe at airports Pepsi could buy all of those big screens that say when the airplane's taking off and uh, you know use that real estate uh, as well. All right, enough of that. Um, we spent a, a, a lot of time. Uh, Ernesto Arroyo, uh, PhD student, uh, did his thesis on, on uh, disruption and interruption. So disruption is when an interrupting um, question. Uh, on your Pepsi machine thing, yeah. what was your goal? My goal was to demonstrate that, um, that uh, uh, engaging people socially would, uh, would be better than, than um, just just you know, using standard advertising methods of branding and 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 uh, and and uh, to 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 get them interested in being there, and there's some value. What? To sell. Yeah, I mean it's Pepsi. But <laughs> um, but I think there's other other things you can do with that. Once you have all that infrastructure there, and this stuff was supposed to go to Beijing. Uh, uh, you can do. You know, you have a Wi-Fi, and you have. You know, there's a lot of things you can do once you throw some technology into a into a uh, into a machine like that, yes? 
uh, it just made me think of sort of the water cooler metaphor and how people tend to groove around the water cooler and socialize, but we don't really see that necessarily around the vending machine. Did, exactly. Did your vent, you know, yeah. improved vending machine enable some... Oh, yeah. That's, that's the whole idea. And we tried a couple of different versions. One of them was literally, we just took a great big screen and slapped it into a different vending machine that just had space for it and, and made a bunch of, you know, tables and chairs around it and made it like, you know, try to tell who was around and, and stuff like that and do some, some net stumbler kind of crap and really embarrass everyone. But, you know, I mean, you know, you got to try these <laughs> weird ideas. Yes? Did you prefer any longitude long Lawn studies to uh, we only spent two years getting that thing to run. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a that, that was a lot of pain making that thing run. I mean, it was way too ambitious technically for us to get to anything longitudinal. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you know, you, you saw a couple hundred thousand dollars right there. <laughs> Somebody have a couple million? Sure, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll turn. It. I tried to get Pepsi interested. They they were so flummoxed. It was really fascinating how how disruptive seeing something like that was to their management because uh, uh, you know they they want to be innovative I mean that's the job of the media lab right they want to be innovative and when they see it they don't know how to start you know they don't know gosh are we gonna start making these things are we gonna how are we gonna interact with somebody that well, what who would even know how to make content for this thing what would be our, our introductions you know product developments what what was when, when did the project happen uh, well, it ended 2008 when I left. Uh, when did we start it? I mean, I talked about, I started talking about it in 2001. So I, I didn't build anything right then. I mean, you know, I try not to build these things because, you know, look at what a mess, what a hard, hard work that is. So I, so I kind of talked about it and that wasn't quite good enough for them. So then I tried, so I talked about it some more and that wasn't quite good enough yet. So then they send me this machine and then I start, you know, finding students and, you know, these things are progressive, but yeah. Yeah, and that particular one, I'm sorry to say, there's no publication that I can point to. There should be, but I'm not sure that we. No, I don't think there's a publication. I think that you know it's been, yeah. Um, okay, so so we played around very early on, the late '90s. We started doing mouse trails to see where people's eyes were moving and uh, by what they were doing with their mouse. And it's like a lot of the time when people's mouses are moving, you actually can learn a lot. And you guys know that by now, but. Back then, it didn't seem as clear. Um, and the, one of the early little things we did was we, we had a, uh, you know, this, this, this video of a baseball game that would come up on your screen. And, and if you were active doing stuff, it would stay small. If the crowd went wild, it'd get bigger. If, if you, uh, you know, weren't doing something, it'd get big. So this idea of kind of modulating your, your, your you know, what was coming to you based on your activity level. And Sean Sullivan, who works here now, and, if, and I don't think anyone here knows Sean Sullivan. You do? Okay, well, he's totally brilliant. And, and you, you should be making all sorts of use of this guy. Anyway, uh, he, one of the first, he did lots of stuff. He made, he made the, uh, the blackboard system that's underneath uh, the car coach. Uh, he uh, made um, this, which was something that any window that popped up on Macs, uh, Unix machines, or, or, or Windows, it would uh, let you have this McFarlane um, uh, negotiation thing where you decided whether you wanted to, uh, you know, have it pop up or, uh, you know, have some mediation or schedule that, you know, it comes up later or, or negotiated. It, it, it annoys you just to find out if it should annoy you. Um, and that was all, a, you know, a fine idea of how to deal with interruptions, but, but we wanted more. And so Ernesto Arroyo, uh, uh, who's now in Spain, um, did, made this, this, this thing where he took some of the low-level stuff, you know, like you guys do, mouse and keyboard, um, and, uh, um, and then some high-level stuff, like, you know, are you reading, are you thinking, are you interacting, are you... Uh, and, and, and we did some, you know, open mind kind of analysis of the text you were typing to figure out what, you, what topic you were in. And, and so instead of just, you know, so we had this kind of interruption model with high-level and low-level things and decided how to... Um, how, how and when to disrupt a person. So there's the interruptions coming in and whether you're going to stop them from doing what they're doing. And the experiment that we ran uh, was we made, and by the way, there were two systems made, Sean Sullivan and an unfinished master's thesis made a really neat one that he did a great experiment at Wellesley College on, you should ask him about. But 
Uh, Ernesto, what he did is he made this very complicated thing. You're supposed to order things, you know, you get in your email messages about what to order and you're looking on the line to, to find out about them and you're doing some calculators and on the calculator and somebody's IMing you and it was actually a, quite a stressful job that we gave people and they had to take breaks and everything. It was, um, but what we did is we just um, decided based on that model, the interruption model, uh, to delay IMs up to two minutes. So we would regroup them so that they were about the same topic. We would delay them or not, and we would, um, and if they were on the topic you were typing or doing something on, we would present them. And we had, you know, two different cases. One case is, hey, get as much orders out as you can, 30% performance improvement. And the other was, make fewer errors, 25% fewer errors. And the I, you know, and this IM, right, is just, you know, some of the IMs were social, some of them were business related. And um, so that was very, very exciting. And the, the companion experiment that Sean uh, did um, was he made a different system with the same idea for a model in it, because he always builds his own systems, uh, or did then. Now he probably works with corporate good stuff. Um, uh, he took it over to Wellesley and he just randomly, he, he turned on and off their system remotely, their, their, their filtering system. And they much preferred, well, we have to see the thesis, which isn't completely published yet, um, which you guys can encourage him to do. But anyway, it, they, uh, my, my understanding is that they greatly preferred the, um, the uh, uh, this thing being turned on, which is amazing for people that are, you know, social butterflies as college students might be. Okay, so, oh, we did some stuff with cell phones. I'm not going to waste our time on um, I kind of find myself saying something about pointing devices when I, when I, when I talk about um, impedance matches anyway. I, I, you know, what I, one of the things I'm known for is the pointing device in IBM's notebook. And uh, I did a lot of work on the ThinkPad actually, um, and that's a whole long, long story. But the, uh, the interesting story that uh, uh, is this pointing device where, um, I had read, right when Stu Card's book and Tom Moran's book came out, I, I read where, the, you know, it turns out um, it, there's like uh, 1.7 seconds to go over to the mouse and back to the keyboard. I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be great to have a pointing device where your hands are so you didn't have to have that. And a few pages later, I actually found where the knee bar uh, actually was faster at pointing than the mouse for the first 10 or 15 minutes in this old English and Engelbart uh, uh, paper. Uh, uh, and what surprised me about that, by the way, recently I, t I confronted Engl uh, English about this and he told me that it wasn't true, which he's wrong. I mean, he just, people didn't realize to look at the data that way to say, well, since the knee has almost no mapping in your, in your, in your mind, how could it be a good pointer? Well, the only reason it was any good is because you don't know how to use a mouse and you don't know how to use a knee for pointing. And, and, you're, and it's dominated by the back and forth. So I spent a lot of time trying to make a pointing device in the keyboard. I started in 84 or 3. And, and by the time I was done, I found we, we, we had this experimental paradigm where you ran a little racetrack on the screen to see how fast you could make selections. And one day I had made a transfer function. As part of this cycle, in two minutes, you make the transfer function, you, you try it out. The transfer function is how hard you pressed, how fast it goes. And why am I going on so long? Oh, well, anyway, uh, and what we found was that there was a big, a very painful transfer function. That means it hurt your finger to use it. And it was 25% faster than anybody had ever reported a joystick being able to make a selection. So that kind of was amazing. And it turns out it wasn't because of the greater dynamic range from pressing harder. It was because it hurt hard to go faster than your eyes can track. Anyway, there's about, I don't know, eight or nine different cognitive modeling kinds of things that ended up in that pointing device. Every single one of them were things that we actually had an idea about, but we were wrong. And through our experiments, we found how to make a cognitive model around that topic, that idea, that made a difference. For example, um, one of the things I found out was uh, you only have four or five bits of control in a, in a, in a finger, uh, force control, uh, of, of repeatable uh, uh, control. And by knowing that, um, <laughs> by learning that, we were able to make a 15% performance improvement for very slow selections, which I could talk about too. Um, on the other, okay, and I'm not going to talk about the the, the joystick. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they're 10. <laughs> they are track trackball as uh, as the slowest. That's what it is. It's just 
Uh, if you want to know the number, the, the, the amount of time, uh, a mouse selection, uh, uh, um, a, a mouse selection uh, for type and select um, is is different. By the way, if it was just selection, the graph looks different. Okay, because I'm getting that extra 0.9 seconds of that of that of the transfer time going over to the over to the mouse. So these these are this is this this would be about no, it's ten, it's 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 think of it as ten. Okay. So basically, the number is going to be about 1.2 seconds. There. Okay. Uh, if you want to get more detail, I can give it to you, but probably not right now. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that it's going to be uh, five minutes, so I'm going to be more rushed as I talk about things, I'm sorry to say. Um, there, there's a, there was a lot of work to, to try to make the integrated um, you know, sensor net environment for the kitchen. Uh, auto, the, um, the Internet Home Alliance was one thing where you know they had the PDA which you could turn on and off the stove from your car and you know burn somebody that happened to be sitting on the stove. Um, so I kind of played around with autonomous things and the the simple first one that I made was this talking trivet. So the talking trivet has this model of cooking in it, and so the idea is if you have it if it if it feels like it's on a really really hot thing maybe you might say fire because it's on the burner. If you put your hands on something that's above 212 degrees and less than 454, maybe it says ready to take out with a question mark because that's probably, you know, that, at that point you've started out gassing all of the, all the, all the water's out gassed and the bread's going to start being, getting brown, right? If you put your hand in, it had two sensors, one in the back and one in the front. If you put your hand into an oven that's 425 degrees and you have like something cold, you know, like a pan in your hand, what should it say? What it says is, should, um, I'll remind you to take that out in 15 minutes. Now, it's a roast, so why would you ever say that about a roast? Well, because if you put a roast into a 425-degree oven, it's going to blacken on the outside in about 25 minutes, and it won't be hot on the inside. It has to be 167 degrees to be cooked, no matter pretty much what it is. Um, and, and so um, by doing that, it makes you think, oh, I better turn it down to 275. So this is this, this idea of what do you respond how do you respond in a way that makes a person think the right thing to solve their problem? And, you know, it's kind of fun to realize that, like, a microchip pick chip with almost no memory can be smart enough to have a model of cooking that works within the context of an oven mitt. And that's kind of the whole point, is that this context is constraining what we expect of a person. And by doing that, we can make things that, are, that, have, that have fidelity. Um, you put a pot on it on the, on the counter, it says, uh, needs rewarming? Because, you know, why would you put a pot, a cold pot, on a, on a thing? All right, enough of that. Um, I'm not going to talk about progressive relationships right now, but I'll just uh, say that we, in the kitchen, we did lots and lots of stuff. But one, one of the ones, and I expect to see this one turn on into a video. There it is. Um, is when there's green, um, when there's something like vegetables, the camera sees that and makes cold water and colors the... Uh, the water blue, and when there's um, a pot, it'll color it red and make it hot to be, you know, if you're going to wash the pot or you're going to boil some water. And if it's uh, hands, it'll turn it purple and, and uh, be warm. Uh, you might not think that's important, but 195 degree water in commercial kitchens does burn people. Uh, another thing we did with it, which was even more fun, is Kaiser came to us and said, hey, you know, 50% <coughs> of the people that are supposed to wash their hands in the hospital don't. And we actually pay people to wa have them wash somebody, wash their hands. So I, they, wanted, they wanted us to put RFIDs on the people, and then they'd be able to have Big Brother tell them if they'd wash their hand or not. And I did that, and I didn't like it. What I did that I liked was we put a little electric solenoid on the door so that if you washed your hands for 20 seconds, the solenoid would pop up, and the door would close to the examining room so that you had an examining room. So if you want to fight the door, the door closure, you can, and you know, but, and, and there's no, but in fact, it's just encouraging good behavior, persuasive, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, there's lots of cool things about that. That, that uh, this, this, this also went up to the right ergonomic height uh, of the person using another camera, and that weird sink is silicon, so I can throw goblets into it with them uh, without them breaking. Okay, well, let's see how this is going. Okay. Salt, please. So there, there I am trying to make, uh, make uh, 
um, crepes, and uh, using this, this sensor pack and a spoon to, to, to do it. And it's a much less you know, fancy story than any of the ones I was telling you. But what's interesting about it is that sensors in the kitchen have just a terrible history. My mom had a thermostatic uh, burner, and no one ever would touch that. You always want the one where you can control it. Um, and, and so why is that, and what do you do about it? And what's fun about this, this you know, just I just had a zinc and aluminum you know, interface for sensor here um, uh, for, for pH. Uh, that, that, you know, that'll tell you if it's you know, got vinegar in it. It'll tell you, you know, if, there's, if, if you put in baking powder instead of baking soda, right? Um, and there's a temperature sensor, it's just a resistor. And that'll tell you very important things. I mean, if you take a look at making candy, making chocolate, how many of us feel that we can do that? You know, pretty much zero. Right? You can? You make, you'll make chocolate? You know, you know, well, well, okay. And you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you, it, you know, you, every part of the vessel has to not get above 120-something degrees for it to change to one of the other three crystal structures that the chocolate... Ugh. So, so the idea is 13% of householders think they can cook right now. And this could take you through and train you, teach you, um, instead of being... Um, anyway... Um, this is another thing that Sean built. Uh, this was a way of making context-aware applications um, by dragging and dropping things and then attaching a uh, support vector machine or a rule-based system to the training data um, that you had associated with that sensor and, and all that good stuff. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to maybe end because it's 10.30 with the, the idea that... <clears throat> It you know, consider, a considerate world is going to be one where everything acts <laughs> now when the user on the cigarette, <laughs> acts as it though it's in a social environment. And uh, maybe I'll just stop him from talking. Yeah. Um, but, um, um, uh, but the point is that we are always in a social uh, setting. And um, this idea that maybe, uh, you know, in the reason that we have a lot, ha, historically sometimes the reason we have had some of the things we have is because they are brand new and we can show them to somebody else. You know, I, I, the, I, the iPhone actually took that to, 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 a, to a level of, that is the way they made their product. Their product is designed not to have a consistent interface. It, even, it has the, one of the worst telephone interfaces, I, I, I mean, telephone address book interfaces I know of, and yet when you open it, when you turn it on, you can show somebody a picture instantly. You can show somebody a map instantly. It's about showing somebody something. Um, this cigarette idea is, again, about that kind of idea. You know, if you haven't smoked it for a while, it kind of vibrates in your pocket and reminds you to take a break. If you, if you come up upon somebody that you've met before, it recognizes that cigarette, sings a little hello song. If it's somebody you haven't, you touch their cigarette, it's kind of like giving them a light. And it, you know, it kind of introduces itself. Uh, you know, it defines you inside and outside of a social circumstance. It, it lets you be a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a self, uh, self-defined person. Uh, it helps set the pace for, for timing activities. It's a com- comforting, calming device. We use everything for this. I mean, I, I see only one coffee cup, two coffee cups in the room. But that's, that is the Starbucks experience, right? You go, and it's kind of a ritual, and it kind of makes you feel calmer, and you kind of, it's part of being part of some... You know, isn't it, you know, usually it doesn't say Microsoft on the front, but around here there's a kind of strange culture. Um, but, but um, you know, and, and I think that uh, everything we have, we use for, for creating and, and establishing and, and, and furthering our, 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 our sense of self and our sense of projecting who we are. And that's all I want to leave you with um, as, as kind of my story. And there's lots of other stuff I could talk about, but I won't. <laughs> I have a question since you caught me with my iPhone. Uh, you mentioned that there is an enormous amount of sensors being packed into these devices you now that the new, new iPhone has mm. gyro and everything. But yet, you convincingly show the, the gaze tracker. It's a phenomenal device. And I see half of the people in the room have glasses. Wouldn't it be that hard to put a gaze tracker on the glasses, and yet there is no commercial product? Would you advocate that? And, and I would love you to give me a little bit of funding and I'll do it. I'll make the company. So uh, how to do it? How to, how to do it? How to convince the, com- the people who make products that it's worthwhile? Well, I think that business cases are, uh, are an art. 
uh, and uh, you know, it's it's a matter of of demonstrating. I mean, one of the worst problems that I had at IBM, you know, I was an IBM fellow, so that means that I was running around the whole company thinking about the whole the whole strategy and and all that fun stuff. And what, what, you, what you learn, probably here you learn the same thing, is that you pitch ideas that are going to be $100 million in a year uh, or else you don't pitch them. And so what does, it mean, what does it mean to pitch that? Well, it means that there's two, two teams at IBM anyway called the marketing team and the planning team. And those teams' responsibility are, are sizing you know, product introductions. And so when you start thinking about how would, what would it mean to introduce a product, what they do is they look for benchmarks. And those benchmarks don't exist for what you're talking about. And so what you have to do is figure out how to get confidence that they exist. And that's why we go into research labs and we build these prototypes. And that's why we take those, those prototypes you know, and we show them on, 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 you know, on, on national TV or whatever we do, you know, big conferences. Everything we can do to get confidence that it's going to be something that's useful and usable. If you're Steve Jobs, you have a luxury that no one else has. That is that you get to just make bets, you know, and he bet on the Newton and failed, and he bet on the, the Apple III and failed, and he bet on the Lisa and failed, right? You know, that's not what we talk about. We talk about where he, where he actually got some more experience and, 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 and you know, used the Newtons, you know, you know as a backdrop to get, to get some amazing, amazing, amazing stuff to happen. Um, and, you know, and, you know, world hero, I mean, legend and all that good stuff. So, with respect to that, I mean, all I want to do, if you, you know, if you were to give me, you know, $100,000 to make something for, for a pair of glasses right now, I'd just put a clock on it. That's what I'd do. You know, I mean, you start with something that you know that, gosh, who can argue with that, right? Why, why would it be bad to have a clock that you could, you know, push a button and turn it off, right? But it just always knows what time it is. I, so that's, that's the kind of, you know, it's just an old-fashioned, you know, IBM, you know, conservative guy. Right, the, the, there's, there's two sides, right? There's the, the, there's the aspirational and then there's the completely concrete and productive. Um, that, that IR, the eye, the eye sensor, I'm, I'm totally, I would totally accidentally put that in that, 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 that camera based, I mean that, 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 that um, thing with, the, with the, um, the clock because it might be that I know how to turn it, when to turn it off pretty much. You know, maybe, you know, and, and that might be the, 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 a feature that you could turn off too. So I mean, I'm just designing the product here in front of you, but which is what I love to do. So, I don't know if that's answering your question. Yeah, I, I could go on all day about this. I've got talks about about product, about business, about you know technology development. In fact, that's a lot of what I do as a consultant is I work with you know executives at companies to think about their strategy for incubation and innovation. Okay, thank you. Yeah.